Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Postmus, and good morning. And thanks for the opportunity to debate, I guess, in a very quiet way, rather than a rude way, against, uh, let's say, a East Midland people coming from Leicester. And Leicester in Italy is very popular right now for sports reason, as you can easily agree. So nothing to disclose. And the overview of my talk uh, will be approaching different items. I mean, starting uh, also because there are, many, uh, there are not too many radiation oncologists in the room. In terms of, uh, let's talk about ASBRT, the benefits of ASBRT in, in different clinical settings, uh, and tackle, of course, uh, before the thoracic surgeon, the criticism uh, coming from them, and future perspective at this regard. So no doubts that, of course, uh, uh, SBRT certainly represented a very important advancement in the arena of early stage non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, what is SBRT? It's an elegant uh, external beam radiotherapy technique allowing us to deliver very aggressive radiation doses in a very high biological uh, radiation doses and uh, in a very few fraction, I mean one till a maximum of eight fractions according to the different fractionation schedule we can use. And this is just to give you an example. This is one of the most typical fractionation schedules used in this scenario. 54 gray in three fractions. And comparing this schedule to the two gray daily fraction, this means roughly 150 gray. So aggressive biological radiation dose. And this is also the reason for which uh, producing very often a sort of uh, ablation, radio ablation of the tumor, we also are modifying the name from SBRT to SEBOR. That means uh, stereotactic ablative radiation therapy. So stereotactic body radiation therapy is probably right now improperly using uh, the word uh, stereotactic because we left uh, the stereotactic frames uh, and we are simply using uh, the image guidance procedures with the tumor itself uh, working as fiducial of itself. So no stereotactic coordinates anymore. Uh, anyway, uh, stereotactic body radiation therapy is uh, highly palatable compared to surgery because it's certainly less invasive, outpatient basis, uh, very few fractions. So this means also a very good compliance for patients. Uh, and this uh, allows us to consider uh, such a technique uh, in a highly palatable therapeutic offer for patients affected with early stage non-small cell lung cancer, not amenable with surgery for functional or medical reasons, uh, regardless of the different surgical approach. In these patients' populations, so once again, very often elderly patients affected with significant COPD, in the last decade, there were many prospective trials and different large retrospective series showing you that with such a technique, you can achieve significant positive results, not only in terms of local tumor control in the range of 80-90%, but in terms of overall survival figures that are certainly comparable to those achievable from the surgical series. Uh, the most typical pattern of failure is represented by systemic relapse, and the risk of systemic relapse uh, is quite similar to the risk of systemic relapse uh, coming from the surgical series, roughly in the range of 15-20%. And this, of course, uh, uh, gives a, a strong rationale in considering, if any, if possible, I mean, from the immunotherapy in the future, let's say, also the chapter of adjuvant treatment in patients receiving SBRT for this risk of metastatic spread. This is the most typical radiological pattern of treatment response. You can see that compared to a lobectomy, you just have uh, some fibrotic evolution of the volume of lung receiving high radiation doses. Uh, but in spite of some later radiological findings uh, in terms of uh, fibrosis, uh, the treatment is certainly quite safe in terms of uh, clinical symptomatic pneumonitis. The risk of severe pneumonitis is certainly very low in the range of 2-3%, and also the risk of severe toxicity is very low, generally speaking. Chest wall toxicity, that means uh, the risk of producing neuropathic pain for tumors close to the chest wall is certainly very, very low as well. For all these reasons, both in terms of efficacy and safety, 
ESMO guidelines, NCC and guidelines are informing us uh, that, of course, uh, SBRT is the non-surgical treatment of choice for peripherally located early stage nosmos and lung tumor. We have, at the moment, less information for the so-called central tumors or for tumors larger than five centimeter. And for the central tumors, uh, we, in the more recent year, modified our fractionation schedules uh, in order to use milder fractionation schedules, uh, and we learned in how to fly in the so-called no-fly zone compared to the beginning experience. So at the moment, we certainly know after the last decade experience that we can offer SBRT in also very elderly patients, very fragile patients, regardless of the PFT status as baseline. And this means if you look at some uh, population registries information, an important spread of such a technique in the clinical arena in the last decade, and of course, uh, this was followed by a parallel decrease in the other therapeutic alternatives, nothing or conventional radiotherapy. And this led to a significant improvement uh, of the overall survival figures in such elderly patients' population. Of course, if you are dealing with patients considered high surgical risk in whom very often you were proponing, I mean, some sublobar recession, like a, wedge recession, like a wedge recession, you can certainly consider such a technique as probably better in terms of local regional tumor control. So please, if you have a patient at risk from a surgical point of view, forget wedge recession in terms of surgical intervention. Uh, discussing the surgical approach with some patients, uh, of course, uh, can allow you to consider the opportunity to, to, to consider other therapeutic alternatives in patients with some concerns in terms of surgical risk. And if you look at the published series, you can find uh, in the retrospective and prospective series, some operable patients who simply refused the surgical approach. And looking at these patients, of course, the survival figures are certainly better than from the elderly patient population. And these surgical rates, these uh, survival rates are absolutely similar to those achievable from surgery. And this is just to further confirm you a prospective Japanese series in uh, operable patients refusing surgery, 76% uh, at three years, like overall survival rate. And so simply moving forward around this cycle, I mean, we started from the very elderly patient, with pa from patients affected with severe COPD, or patients uh, with concerns about surgery. And so considering the operable patients and the brave operable patients, the issue of debating between surgery or radiation oncology is not so new. If you look at this JAMA paper more than 50 years ago, there were some guys writing on the possibility to consider for the good results achievable with super voltage therapy in inoperable patients, also such a technique in operable patients as well. This means, of course, that uh, when we are trying to compare similar patients coming from the two different worlds uh, using uh, such a technique like the propensity score matched analysis, uh, you, can sh you can see in the literature many papers showing you a similar outcome for similar patients treated both uh, with surgery or with SBRT. And of course, putting together all these considerations, uh, there was a strong rationale in considering a win-to-win -win strategy in terms of prospective phase three clinical trials. And of course, uh, some years ago, 2008, 2009, three different phase three clinical trials were launched across the world, but all of them were closed for very poor accrual. As you can see, 10 patients, 20 patients, 30 patients, uh, out of the expected accrual. Last year, so 10 months ago or something like that, in Lancet Oncology, this pooled analysis was published 
And this pooled analysis uh, uh, was based on 60 patients, so a very few number of patients are coming from the two different, from two out of the three phase three clinical trials. The Dutch trial, the Rosal, uh, the Rosal trial, and the American trial, the STARS trial. So even with the limitation of a so small number of patients, uh, you can agree that the clinical outcome of these patients is similar. Of course, uh, the morbidity and mortality, mortality, unfortunately, in such an experience was was for surgery than with SBRT. But the conclusion of the authors of this pooled analysis uh, was simply to underline a sort of equipoise between SBRT and surgery, even if with the limitation of the small number of patients. And so this means that you can certainly consider SBRT as an option for treating operable stage one nosmos and lung cancer. And in your routine clinical work, certainly waiting for new potential phase three clinical trial and so a sort of level one evidence what we have to do, discussing pros and cons of the different therapeutic modalities. Of course, surgery has a lot of pros, pathological diagnosis, uh, adequate uh, st staging uh, with uh, information of the mediastinal nodes and so driving an optimal adjuvant phase. But of course, unfortunately, surgery has also some cons in terms of morbidity and mortality. At the moment, uh, I guess that you agree that in the vast majority of early stage nosmos and lung cancer, we are still considering lobectomy as the standard therapeutic approach compared to sublobar recession. And of course, morbidity and mortality of lobectomy is, is good, but is absolutely not totally free of complication. And looking at this slide, for example, from the UK National Registry, more than 10,000 patients. Recent year, the risk of mortality at 30 and 90 days is 3 and 6% overall. And of course, uh, considering an expected increase of incidence of early stage nosmans and lung cancer for several reasons, including in the elderly population, the so-called silver tsunami, I guess that all of you agree with me that probably less toxic treatments for small tumor in elderly patients are certainly more than welcome. Cyber, pros and cons. Of course, uh, pros, less invasive treatment compared to surgery, and this is certainly very good and very palatable, palatable for patients, uh, outpatient procedure, preservation of lung function and better quality of life. Cons, and these are normally voices coming from surgeons, treatment without definitive pathological verification, and so some issues are affecting the follow-up of these patients. Let's see. So pathological verification. Pathological verification is certainly needed in every single patient. Sometimes you are not able to get such a diagnosis and you are basing your treatment on what we call the clinical proof of malignancy. But you can see also in this slide that there are large series with 100% of patients getting an histological verification and the clinical outcome is certainly similar. Anyway, in some series or in some countries, you are using such a technique even if you are not able to deal with an histological verification of the tumor, but you have to use specific models predicting the probability of malignancies that are country-based and country-based validated. Radiological issues in the follow-up of these patients. So CT changes that can mimic a tumor recurrence. Uh, uh, we are learning, we are improving our experience uh, in having new parameters uh, able to distinguish between radiation fibrosis or tumor recurrence in terms of uh, high risk radiological features. Other concerns relative to the SBRT, the lack of adequate staging for mediastinal nodes sampling, and so the possibility to missing adjuvant chemotherapy in fit patients with mediastinal node upstaging. First of all, inadequate staging. Some patients receiving surgery and affected with early stage normal and lung cancer are not receiving, and these are surgical informations, and optimal staging in their mediastinal nodes. Anyway, the risk of local regional isolated node relapse is very low 
even in patients receiving SBRT without invasive mediastinal staging. And we are trying to improve our sensitivity and sensibility in staging mediastinum with new techniques uh, that were discussed before. And missing adjuvant chemotherapy. I guess that this could be important consideration. If you start from 100 patients affected with early stage normal cell lung cancer, after mediastinal staging, 15 out of 100 will be upstaged to N2 and N1, N2 diseases. And let's say two thirds of these patients can receive, in terms of fit, adjuvant chemotherapy. The benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy is well known. And so you need 200 patients to treat considering surgery in terms of driving treatment decision at this regard. But of course, even considering just 1% of risk for lobectomy, of course, the number of patients needed to harm is significantly lower. And so, another important information in our routine clinical work is to discuss pros and cons with patients, for sure, also considering what we are calling patient-reported outcome. From this point of view, in terms of quality of life, uh, there are several items for, who, for whom probably the performance achievable with SBRT are better than those achievable with surgery. And so this means that, of course, patients reported outcome uh, have to be included to inform shared decision in discussing therapeutic option between physician and patients. And this is just to give you an example, even if in a very limited number of patients, the comparison in terms of quality of life between surgery and SBRT from the pooled analysis. So conclusion, in the era of personalized medicine, I, I guess that you agree with me that there is no an ideal therapy in every single patient. Surgery now, right now is being challenged by SBRT in this scenario. Survival rates comparable to those achievable with surgery, less morbidity. And of course, you have to balance advances and disadvantages in discussing with patients the therapeutic proposal. And certainly, MDT is the gold standard. MDT means that, of course, you can offer a fragile patient a very good therapeutic opportunity. You can offer such an approach in patients considered at high surgical risk. We certainly need new phase three clinical trials before considering SBRT better than surgery in every single patient. This is certainly true. So new randomized trials are certainly warranted. And last hope with a question mark could be this one. So two trials, a little bit different, one from the USA and one from the UK. The second one, the latter one from the UK is limited to the, let's say, high surgical risk patients. But very important, uh, and these are the two last slides, both of them involve an initial approach uh, to the eligible patients done by a more neutral part represented by a pulmonologist or medical oncologist or rather than a thoracic surgeon or a radiation oncologist. At uh, this regard, I guess it could be useful to share with you such an experience coming from the, Den from the Netherlands is a survey done on thoracic oncologists showing you that in terms of uh, which is the most appropriate treatment in patients affected with early stage normal cell lung cancer. And the conclusion was uh, a limited consistency observed in treatment recommendation between the three different professionals. And just to conclude, of 126 Dutch thoracic oncologists responding, 55% agree that surgery and SEBOR were comparable options in stage one normal cell lung cancer. But of course, this answer is highly biased by the professional jacket. 18% of thoracic surgeon, 83% of radiation oncologists, roughly 50% pulmonologists. Thank you very much for your attention.